All right. So anyway, it's, it's an interesting privacy issue. Uh, this I thought was pretty good. Uh, he's, there's these online signature services where you log into some website, you draw your signature at the mouse, and now you put it on documents. And he's pointing out that this is in no way better than not signing it at all. <laughs> But there's just a single website that's putting it on, and it's 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 a very it's not even two-factor authentication. It's just like to impress people who are stupid to make them think you signed it, um, and that's not that exciting. Anyway, um, I think we're up to the official time here, so let's go here. Let me just mention scheduling issues for people who are. Um, so you know what's happening. So here we are. We're almost at the end of this class. Here's chapter 18 this time, or chap yeah, chapter 18 this time. Next time I'm going to talk about Hopper, which is not in the textbook, just demonstrate the debugger, and that's it. The class after that is canceled, and then there's no more lectures. There's just a final exam that will be online this week. So uh, this class and the next class, and that's it. And next week. There are events, and the most important one is May 1. There's another job fair on campus, so uh, come to that if you're looking for a job. We have a new bunch of employers. Uh, that'll be at 4 o'clock uh, next Tuesday. And then I've got some uh, guest speakers, Kyle Rankin on Thursday, and Yakub Sendor on Tuesday after that. So those are talks you might want to go to. Anyway, let me uh, mute these guys so they don't do each other. And let's talk about source code auditing. So now we'll get down to defense, which is, of course, the hard part, much harder than attack. And uh, so one very nice way to find your vulnerabilities would be to look through your source code. I am amazed at how ineffective these tools are. This would seem like a very good way to catch vulnerabilities. It would be to just look for patterns of code. Like, it seems to me like you could trivially, trivially spot format strings, buffer overflows, and other things. Um, but in practice, the tools we have here don't seem very effective. <coughs> so anyway, if you have the source code, you can just use grep to look for patterns, and there are tools that are a little bit better than that. Cscope is one that's been around for a long time that supposedly can let you look at huge things, like the whole Linux kernel that's all interlocked and search through it. Ctags is another one that will index the source code, so you can then uh, search for similar patterns and places where this thing is referenced elsewhere in the code, which would help you track down problems. Um, you can just use a text editor, of course, uh, and the command line oriented text editors are designed to handle a large document and to quickly find tags and such. A lot of them have bracket matching, so they'll easily find mismatched brackets and also find the matching tag, so you can easily spot exactly what have I included. Um, all right. And then there's the automated tools. Splint is one of the older ones. Uh, yeah, I think it's so far out of date that I didn't bother trying to make a project based on it. It appears to have been abandoned more than 10 years ago. <coughs> um, but there are a lot of others out there specialized to each language. Um, I wrote a well, project where we use CPP check, and we'll play with this a little later. CPP check is easy to use, but very ineffective. It reminds me of online vulnerability scanners that are intended to find things like SQL injection. In practice, they only find half of what they're designed to find. Yeah, I, I assume what this means is it is far more difficult than you would think. That uh, searching for something with a certain vulnerability, there are more ways to do it than are immediately obvious. So, um, yeah, let's just do this project 19. It's probably time for that. So let me start up my Kali, and let's play with this. Uh, so there's my Kali, and as usual, SSH is better than trying to get VMware tools to work. It only works about half the time. Uh, wait, I got a Python. I got, whoa, okay, let's just, okay. I somehow got extra junk here. Root at 172.16.1.255.0. There we are, Tor, okay. So, uh, all right, so let me just bring up my project, which I might as well do here. This is, um, there, there, I think it's 19X or something, there we are, okay. So, PWD is the first one. 
I'm just using some of the code that we used earlier in this class that has simple vulnerabilities. So if we look at pwd.c, this is one we used in a very early project. This has a simple buffer overflow. It calls this test pw function, and down in the test pw function, it defines a 10-letter password, and then it does gets with no limit. So the user can type in more than 10 characters, and it will overflow. So it would seem like the uh, CPV check ought to find that. So CPV check on pwd.c finds nothing. However, that's the default conditions. You can do a little better by turning on all tests with uh, dash dash enable equals all. And then it found obsolete function gets called. It did not find the buffer overflow. It just, this is by the way, the compiler will tell you the same thing, the GNU compiler, that you probably should knock off using gets. It is considered unsafe, which is, I'd say, an extremely shallow level of analysis, but that's what it gives you. So uh, then you can try a format string. I don't know how any scanner can fail this. It's incredibly obvious. You've printed something without the format string. It seems to me like I could just write a grep regular expression that would pick that up. So if we do a CPP check on that, it finds a buffer overrun and it does not find the format string vulnerability. So like I say, I'm pretty disappointed with these tools, yeah. I don't know. There may be some way to extend it and put in your own definitions and that might be the thing to do. I'm. Uh, I wonder if maybe there's a commercial tool we should be using that would be better. These are just very unimpressive. And if you take a look at the heap overflow, here's one that has um, a, um, here, you create a data structure and then you, um, where's the overflow? Here, you do a stir copy. Now you copy an argument into a data structure without checking the size and it's possible to overrun, and we were taking over the machine with that. So let's see if it can find that one, heap zero. And here it found a buffer overrun and a memory leak. So it did discover that buffer overrun. Didn't know if it was stack or heap, but it did discover the buffer overrun. And by the way, this is only the latest update. When I wrote this project two years ago, it did not find the buffer overrun at all. The only thing it found was memory leaks, which means these variables are defined and not cleared, which is a problem for performance, but it's not a security problem. Yeah? Didn't do what? Didn't delete. Yeah, didn't uh, free or delete. Yeah. So um, anyway, so it did pick up something, and that's, I'd say, the same as any others. That's why I made it. These are ones I checked to grade it, because in the earlier version, this is all you get. The newest version, it does detect above buffer overrun. So... That's the joy of these code checkers that I was able to easily find and use. Uh, I imagine there are better code checkers, but the readily available ones are very shallow. All right, so uh, Flaw Finder I thought was much better. If you install this thing, um, I had much better results with it. Uh, so I might break a project using that. If I get industrious, um, it seemed more effective. Anyway, so the general idea here is you look for specific lines of code. Uh, your auditor does not have to understand everything about the application, usually. Um, and this means, of course, the same thing with uh, pen testers trying to break in. If you, can, if you have a complicated vulnerability that involves multiple areas of code, you're not going to find it with a source code audit, and you're going to have trouble finding it if anyway. Um, so the bottom-up approach is where you read a lot of the code and try to understand exactly what it does, like a complete flow chart of how all the data flows, and that would be more thorough, but it's a lot more work. Uh, most auditors are in between. They find they start with the code that takes input from the user and then try to follow that and focus on the part that takes input from the user because certainly if you run something like a source code scanner, you'll find a bunch of flaws that don't matter because it's a possible overrun, but the data did not come with the user anyway. The data was automatically generated by another part of code, so it's never too long anyway, so it doesn't really matter. This is true of all 
pen testing. If you do any kind of pen testing on a network, you'll find 100 problems and 90 of them do not matter. Te technically, something can be ejected here, but in practice, there is no way to actually harm the business by ordering a product and not paying for it or anything. It's just a minor flaw that doesn't really impact the business's mission, so they don't really care. All right, so uh, <laughs> one kind of generic logic errors. This is where you just have something that is misunderstood by one part of the code. Uh, one fine example from DEF CON a few years back was the wildcard certificates. Um, this is where you have a serious problem without any bug. Uh, the certificate authorities were running code that was written back in the 90s in Pascal. And so when you buy a certificate online from the certificate authority, it generates it in Pascal, so I can buy a certificate with a null byte in it. So I can buy star null byte dot evil dot com because in Pascal that is a valid string. Because in Pascal you store the bytes of a string in ASCII and then the first byte is the length of the string up to 255. So you can have a null byte in the middle of a string in Pascal. So the software on the server will sell you that certificate and you can have it. And then when your browser that was written in C tries to validate a certificate, when you, when you go to a website like google.com, there are three tests. Is the certificate from a trusted authority? Is the certificate within the valid date range? And does it match the domain? And you can buy a certificate at a valid date from a real authority with this name, and then when it compared the name on the certificate to the domain name in the browser, it would always match because C would interpret this null byte as the end of the string, and your name is star, which is the wild card that matches everything. So if you buy the certificate, you can now put up a fake Gmail page, Yahoo page, MSN, and the browser will pass the validation check for all of it. And two researchers discovered this independently and bought them and demonstrated it at DEF CON a few years ago. They bought 19 of these certificates, and they were in the wild for a while before they got revoked. Uh, and it was not a bug in any part of the system. It was a consequence of one language being used to write the certificate authority and another language being used to write the browser. The browser didn't have a bug and the CA didn't really have a bug. And it sat up there for like 20 years before somebody figured it out. It's, that's a logic error. And I, that's really hard to find. Um, there's, and then there's the very simple bug classes like the kind we just saw it picked up where you're using gets. You use these functions which caused all the buffer overflows in the Aleph null generation of buffer overflows and all, everything will warn you not to use these things anymore. These things are all, all these things that do string copies in C without limiting the length are just asking for it and any modern compiler will tell you not to do it. And if you get the Microsoft recommended libraries to write window code, Microsoft got rid of all these and replace them with safe alternatives. And that's what they did to improve their own security. Um, until they wrote Windows XP Service Pack 2, Microsoft developers did not know what a buffer overflow was. They admitted this. Then they changed their whole security policy, and they made all their developers read the book, uh, Writing Secure Code, and they made a bunch of standard C environment settings. And they now have published that so anybody else can use it too. And they get rid of these functions and they set a bunch of defaults. And, you know, they set the language so that even if the developer doesn't know what they're doing, these really dangerous things are not going to work in the dangerous way anymore. And they did pretty much wipe out uh, the buffer overflows. Yeah, here's, this is something, I was unable to find a more recent document showing this, but Microsoft in one of their vulnerability reports did get to the root cause of code execution vulnerabilities for many years. And back before 2008, the number one problem really was plain old buffer overflows, like what we've done in this class. That was the way in. And Microsoft improved their stuff greatly by using better C libraries, by having data execution prevention, address space layout randomization, canaries in the stack. They put in all those defenses and they really worked to where this went from like 50% down to like 5% of overflows. So they fixed the buffer overflow problem. And you can see um, heap corruption remains a significant problem and the latest versions of Windows in the uh, 2000 16 server and 2012 R2, there's a bunch of new heap defenses which we talked about as they went by. So Microsoft's putting a lot of effort into addressing their heap vulnerabilities. The one that is growing and growing is dangling pointers, use after free. Um, that's tough. And I'm not aware of any new defenses coming out for that. That is now the leader. 
as of 2013, which is the latest year I could find this kind of evidence on. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Anything you point here is a subset of three? Yes, they're essentially the same thing. So you, the way it works is you have a variable you allocate on the stack, then you free it, but you don't destroy it. So the pointer to it still retains a valid value. And then, so when you, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to call malloc and then call free and then set the value to zero or no. That's the correct way to so use the heap. Yes. If you don't do that, you still have a pointer that points to a part of the heap that you're not supposed to be using anymore. Well, you have, so you have you allocate room on the heap and then you take user input to put in there. And then you free it, but you don't delete it. And then you go back and there's a chance to use user input and put it there. It has to be a mistake in the code where you can take user input that goes there after it's destroyed. Are using within the same code? Yes. And now what it means is now you can write directly into the heap without being constrained by a structure. So you can do an overflow. You can write you can write more data in the heap or you can write on top of the next object stored in that place. So you end up being able to corrupt the so contents of the heap. So the next time you that's right. It's very much like the buffer where you define the buffer up here and when you use it, it doesn't know how big it should be anymore. So you can easily put too much there. Here, the place where you use it is completely different than the place where you create it and where you destroy it. So when you're using it, that code does not know that this has been freed already. This is a fundamental logic. You know, it makes me think you could just write a better language where everything you need to know about a variable is all in the same place. But the way C is structured, it's not. So it's very easy to have the code on your page look good, and you don't know that it's incompatible with something in another page. But you want, but you want to know what was, was before, then you keep track of everything, you stole everything down. Yes, and, and that's the problem. Um, and both at the human level of the programmer and at the execution of the code, you will slow everything down and make it complex if you check everything all the time. And that's why languages like Visual Basic won't have any of these problems. Like if you use a variable, Visual Basic will check to see if I have enough room, check to see if it's been created. If it hasn't, just create it. If it's the wrong type, just convert it. You know, it will not let any of this happen. And so it runs slower. Yeah. Uh, well, the compiler and the runtime module, it'll change. You know, so it's, that's the point. C is very simple. It's a small step for machine language. And it leads to all these problems. It's up to the developer to keep track of all this. And in the modern world, when you have many developers and updates and teams and code coming from external agencies that you're patching in, it's very hard for all of them to really know everything they need to know about the assumptions the other people have made. Yeah, anyway, so uh, here's another one. I'm showing how they overcome Microsoft defenses in 2012 to 2014 uh, to get past ASLR and DEP. We talked about this. Those defenses, address space layout randomization and data execution prevention, make it very hard to find your injected code or make it run. So um, one popular technique, of course, is just finding a DIL that does not have ASLR. Uh, finding some information disclosure, like a register you can read that tells you where you are is popular. but Prop is the main one that will be used here, return-oriented programming, where you just piece together pieces of existing code to turn it off. And another one that's popular is heap spraying, which you did in some of the projects, at least the extra credit one, where you just fill a lot of memory with your attack, so it doesn't matter where it is. Um, but these are all good ways to get around it, and that's what any good defense does. It makes the attacker have to get over it. Yeah. Yes, I think it is. Let me bring it up. If you want to do the heap spray, it's uh, it's here, project 14. It's actually not extra credit. They, they only set up the yeah, this only does part of it. Yeah, we didn't actually do the attack, but you did get to see the spray. This is how it's done. You just fill it, yeah. Now, to actually do it, you take this and replace it with a Metasploit type attack with a big knob sled, like 10,000 bytes. So you have a big knob sled and a little egg, and that's what you put everywhere. So when you jump, you're very likely to hit the knob sled. Here we just used plain text just to demonstrate the, uh, the spray part of it. We did not go all the way to the end. Good. All right, and then of course, format strings. Um, seems like this would be very easy to catch with a code audit. 
although I'm amazed that CPP check does not find it. Uh, this tends to happen in logging code because people, you'd have to have someone that prints something that's in a hurry and doesn't really care how it looks. So it's probably not going to be code going to where the user will see it. But logging, I know I do this all the time. Every time I have bugs in a code, I just go print one, print two, print three to see what's going on and often just print a variable. And I just don't care. And I intend to remove that later. But obviously, sometimes they don't. And since it's not going to anywhere where anyone will notice, it could be that way for a while. This is why I've seen this pretty often in Android apps, that they log secrets, like the password, that they shouldn't. It's a fairly common mistake because I'm sure during development, you log everything to debug it, and then you're supposed to clean it up, and often that process doesn't work. Um, so here you go. There's writing a syslog without a format. Uh, then there's incorrect bound checking. This happens a lot, where you do check to make sure something is not too big, but you make some kind of mistake. So your check doesn't really correctly prevent things from getting too big. Snort had one of these, where it's processing a series of network packets, and it checks each fragment to see if it's not too large, but it is assembling something from all those fragments, and it is the total of them all that should not be too large. This is what happened with the ping of death that affected Windows 95 you could send a series of packets that would add up to more than 64K on the server and crash it. Each packet wasn't too big, but they were reassembled into a buffer that wasn't big enough to handle it. And so that happened here with Snort. Um, and here's the game. It's got a check to make sure. Yeah, if length greater than size, then block. But this length was the length of only one chunk, not the cumulative length of all the chunks. So it did not prevent the overflow from happening. Um, then there's loops. This is actually very common. You have an if, then you have a while, then you have another if, then you have a for, you have loop within loop until you sort of lose control. And you end up having some, this is a state machine. You have one state that could be this way or that way, then another state, then another state, until you have like 16 combinations and you don't really get them all straight. So it's possible to have this test be true, that test be false, and end up in a strange place that you're handling incorrectly. And that led to an overflow in send mail. It's very easy for that to happen. It's very much like mis nesting your parentheses to where you include the wrong number of statements inside a condition. Most, yeah. Most software get kind of lost and mixed up even if you follow the proper syntax. Yes. I mean, I do it in Python. And even when I'm writing like these simple... Uh, Scoring engines. I've been writing those where it is, I get data from the user in an HTML form. Now I want to decide whether you want or not. So I say, well, if they have the right answer in lowercase, that's fine. If the right answer is in uppercase, do this. If they have a special name, I don't want to log it because that's me testing it. And even with a simple thing like that, I sometimes get called fouled up to where it does the wrong thing. The software fouled up, right? Uh, well, no, the software runs, but my logic is shot. It's very easy when you have if, if, if that you get it confused in your mind and you do not have all of the eight possible conditions correctly handled. Like three if statements are eight possible states. And you have to make sure you've got them all covered. And if you're just throwing code together, it's easy to make the mistake. Use what? Right, I did that. That's what I do now, yeah. But there's other things that happen. There's often more than one way. Yes. Yeah, that's why, you know, it just, it just tends to happen. Um, so here's one. This is what happened with send mail. You would send something like this, and this would cause an overflow. Because I think the greater than and less than signs didn't count towards the total or something, because it thought they would mean something different. Anyway, there's a lot of off-by-one vulnerabilities. Uh, this whole thing of having a null terminator at the end of a C string seems like a really bad idea. If they would ask me, I would have said the Pascal way is a lot better, where you just have the link in one thing. Because there's a bunch of times when it's hard to tell about that null at the end. Like, what are you going to do with 16-bit characters and so on? And it turns out uh, there are quite a lot of examples in C where you find a way to skip over the null and have a string suddenly turn out to be much longer than you think it is. Um, here's an example from Apache. Um, it has a, if the last length plus length is greater than alloc and last length plus length is greater than alloc n, then you allocate more space. And if both statements are true, you end up accidentally allocating the space one byte too small. So the mem copy 
that happens down here will copy one extra byte. And that can overwrite the pointer. So overwriting the one byte means you, your string now gets much longer and includes stuff that shouldn't have been in there. Um, here's open FTP. If the last character is a quote, it's misunderstood as a delimiter, and the length comes out wrong. So again, you can write an extra byte at the end if it's a byte that they've incorrectly handled in the code. And this so string ncat is an attempt to fix this. This, if you watch, there's so many foolish things that happen in C to try to deal with this. When you copy a string, do you want to put a null byte at the end or not? And different C functions do different things. So str ncat does put a null byte at the end, and therefore it can write an extra byte, trying to put the null byte there, and it can write it out of bounds. So I mean, this is in the documentation. So uh, incorrect use here is you write to the buffer from the input the size of this minus the strength length of buffer. Um, you need to have a minus one here. You needed to remember and save one byte for the null byte. And if you don't, it puts the null byte beyond the string affecting the next string. This is the kind of thing that happens a lot. Um, all right, then there's non-null termination. Like, say, if you do not terminate your string with a null because one of these errors happen and the null doesn't get there, then you, your string is the original string plus memory until it hits a null. So you have a whole bunch of stuff out there, and you can get memory arbitrary code execution out of that. Now you can write to memory. It's like a dangling pointer. You can now write in that string and affect RAM that you should do. <coughs> You shouldn't have been able to hit. All right, then there's string end copy. If there's not enough space, it won't null terminate the string. It will just write the bytes and finish, and it won't have the null, so it will inherit all this other stuff. So, you know, it's strings are very problematic in C. All right, so here's an example. The first string end copy will not null terminate this not term buff. And so the second stir copy is now unsafe. Even though these buffers are the same size, this one's unsafe because that because you're going to copy a string on top of it, and then it's going to continue in other bytes. So you can still give the user a chance to overwrite things, even though uh, it appears that you reserved enough size for it. The buffers are the same, and yet you still have an unsafe copy because you had to remember to only to use one byte less to leave room for the null part. So it's kind of mad. Here you are putting the zero in there. Uh, this is, yeah, this is the terminator. You have to put it in, and that means if you reserve 256 bytes, you can really only use 255 bytes, and the last one has to be the null byte. This is, uh, this is, I think, the fundamental origin of all these problems in C. If you define a variable, you have to remember how big it is. If you define a string, you have to remember that it's got a null on the end. There are these gotchas that you'll people will just naturally forget frequently. So um, here's another one that can happen. If you process more than one byte at a time of your string, then you can skip past the null byte so you won't notice it. Um, here's a good example that happened to Apache. Apache is trying to deal with URLs. Well, the URL starts with like HTTP colon slash slash. So when they um, reach the colon, they then skip ahead by three because they know it's a colon slash slash. So this means if you give it a URL that has a colon followed by something other than a slash slash, it will jump over it. And so all you have to do, there are some protocols that do not use the slash slash. So here's LDAP colon A. It will find the colon, skip the next two bytes, including the null terminator, and now you're reading all this memory that was not in that variable. So. It's like a uh, format string vulnerability or a dangling pointer. You now got a way to read and write into memory that was not allocated for this purpose. All right, then there's signed comparison, and boy, there are so many of these. And these affect high level languages like JavaScript and PHP. There was a fun demonstration in the 125 class of just all the horrible things that happen when you have a loose typing language where it guesses whether things are integer or float or string and converts them before comparing them. <laughs> so if you use a signed variable or two different types of integers and then compare them, uh, the language will often attempt to compare them, not just give you an error message, but convert one of them, and then you have um, confusion. So here's buff size and r remaining. And those are both integers, but one is a signed integer, 
and one is an unsigned integer, and now you have an if statement. It compares these two numbers and tries to do something if it's bigger and something different if it's smaller. And the problem is um, they are different types of variables, so if you put a negative number in the signed variable, it converts them both to unsigned and misunderstands it. That's why it's a... Uh, that's the kind of trick. It, it also overflows and underflows, where you make a large negative number that's so big it gets wrapped around and turned into a positive number again. That happened. And there's just many different kinds. These are all integers. So all different kinds, 32-bit, 16-bit, signed and unsigned, all different kinds of values. You know, the same pattern of bits will be interpreted as a different value. And when you put it in an if statement, it might be converted to something without you realizing it because, once again, the thing you're comparing it to is defined far away by somebody else long ago, and you don't really remember whether it's integer or signed, long or short or unsigned or whatever it is. And then, this one was pretty cute. This was the official recommendation I found online of how to write a secure login script in SQL. And the point here is, so in comes the password. You then hash the password with 512 and assault, which is okay. And then you compare it here with two equal signs. The error here is that should be three equal signs. This is something to know about PHP. If you use three equal signs, then they have to be identical, which means they have to have the same value and they have to be the same variable type, which is what you should do. But many people do not know that, including the author of this blog telling you how to write a secure function. He put in two equals. If you put in two equals, it will do what I was just describing. If they are different types, it will convert them to make them the same type. And that can be the kiss of death, and uh, our snake found it. So what's cute here is, if you have a hash, and the hash starts with 0e, and it doesn't contain any letters, this is interpreted as a number, 0 to the power 125 billion, which is 0. This is not a string. It is a number. And when you put it in a comparison, the other entity will be interpreted as a number, and it will pass. So if you have a password that hashes to a hash like this, you can just find any other password that hashes to a hash like this, and it's always equal. So this is, uh, when I first read this, I thought all you needed was the zero E, which means this would happen one time in 256. So that would mean you could break into everybody's website by just using this magic password that hashes to zero E something. But it turns out you have to have no numbers all the way down. And that is very rare, more like one in a million because you have an almost 50% chance of a number in each place. So it's like flipping, you know, that many coins, like 32 coins and getting all heads. Is so, treating what's that? It treating it's treating that as zero. So I can use another password that hashes to zero E something else, and it will accept it as the right password. Because the hash of my password equals the hash of your password, because they're both interpreted as numbers that are zero. So all these digits can be different. So it is a defect, but it's not a huge defect in practice. But it probably would be a much larger defect in the older hash functions like MD5 that are shorter. Long hashes like SHA-256, the chance of this happening get very rare. Anyway, another one is double free. Uh, if you free a chunk of memory and then you accidentally free it again, then the second free can lead to arbitrary memory corruption because remember, when you free something, it reads the contents of it to find the pointers to the one before and the one after, and then it goes and writes on the pointers of the chunk before and the chunk after to branch over it. So the free involves reading uh, data and addresses from the block and writing based on what you find there. We did this and we were able to corrupt something and then hit a free, and at the free you get an arbitrary write where you control both where it's written and what is written. And if you free twice, you get a second chance to write after that's already been freed. So the first time you free it, it becomes available for reuse. The code may point to it again. Now you get a chance to write there. And the second time you free it, it will find what you put there. So a double free, is like a dangling pointer. It is likely to give me a chance to write to memory without hitting the structure I should hit there and be able to put in whatever I want. You would have to uh, reallocate something, and then that chunk will be reallocated. 
Because once you free it, it becomes available. Then you create something else, then you free it again, and now you're going to misunderstand what I put in there. That's the, that's the simple exploitation case that I understand. You just freeing twice is not a problem, but in practice, freeing twice in two different places means I'm likely to have a problem because the whole point of having this heap is you're going to free it, and then your program is going to reuse that memory. Yeah, that's the whole reason you free it. You free it, and then you, you'll have someplace in your code you have alloc, and someplace, then you use the data. You put something in there, then you free it. Then it's going to go back and alloc it again and put data in and use it again. But if you free the old memory, that if you didn't delete the pointer again and you free it a second time, then you're going to have an unexpected free. Yeah, not necessarily rewrite it. Yes, you would have to have some new data written in there. If you just put free and then put free after it in the same code, that's not a problem. It's what it, the reason it's a problem is you have one module freeing it, and then you have someone add something to your code, another function, which also frees it down here. So, and they get used in some not, not immediate way. So something changes in between. That's what would make the vulnerability. And then there's out of scope memory usage. You could use a memory region before or after it is valid. This is another one they call dangling pointer. So you point to an object, then you delete the object and you're not using it anymore, but you didn't zero the pointer. So I can write here and end up writing into memory that is interpreted as something else. And I hit something important that's used for a pointer and then I can take over the machine. Uh, uninitialized variable usage is another way. Um, there's areas that are nulled when the program starts, but the heap and the stack are not nulled, and they actually contain data left over from previous functions. So if you use them without defining them first, I can see data, this remnant data, and mess with it. And this is essentially what format string vulnerabilities are. Remember, you could just see what was on the stack that was not actually placed there to be used by that function. It was just left over from other purposes, and that's that's essentially what this is. Um, and as we know, you can totally take over the machine through that. Uh, so these things tend to be fixed, but there will be cases where they get by. In general, many classes of bugs are most likely to be found in code that's not used very often. That's where this may persist for a very long time without getting caught, like that problem with the... Uh, Pascal-based certificate authorities. That was sitting there for 20 years before anybody noticed it. And Heartbleed was sitting there for two years before anybody noticed it. And the same thing with the Debian lacking a seed command for the random number generator. Some, that caused a error. Someone commented it out, and all the branches of Debian Linux for two years were using non-random numbers because the random number generator was never seeded, and it took two years before anybody noticed. This tends to happen. So yeah. Did, uh, Intel um, hardware have full of goods in years? Yes, that Spectre and Meltdown have been in there for at least ten years, and not noticed and never patched. But they never did much harm, right? No, none of the. As far as we know, the same thing with Heartbleed. As far as we know, nobody figured it out and actually exploited it. But it makes everybody nervous. They could have, and you would not know. That was the thing that really got people mad about Heartbleed was because on, it affected HTTPS servers and it was never, not in any log anywhere. So you could not prove that it had not been exploited. And that's what people want because, of course, they have secrets and compliance and cryptographic keys and proprietary data, and they want to be told, we patched it before the bad guy stole it, and no one was really able to say that. That's, that makes you very nervous at a position of responsibility. You want to say, we secure our stuff and we know that it didn't get stolen. And you can't really say that. So here, um, if data is null, so there's this thing, there's some condition, and then you allocate something and put data in it. But if it doesn't happen, you free it down here and return. So it is possible to free it without assigning any value to it. So you end up freeing memory that was not filled with anything. So it's going to have leftover memory from the last function that used that value, which is now used to do write operations in the free. So this means you just have to find out whatever used the RAM before 
And by putting something in there, you can take over the machine. You put it in memory, and when it, this, so that's, that's uh, how an, an unexpected pre can lead to an overwrite. All right, so that's the game, the uninitialized distributed left over previous data. So there is some previous operation that used that RAM. I need to run it in the debugger and find that. And now I put in there a pointer to something like a global offset table, and I can take over the machine. Uh, so heap buffers are temporary. A uh, program can use a pointer. After a free, um, you might have more than one variable name pointing to the same object. That's another thing that is possible in C and sort of horrible. And so once again, you might even free it and even clear the pointer, but there was another pointer pointing to it. So you still get a chance to write to something that is no longer allocated properly for that and is being used for another purpose. Um, then there's multi-threaded code. Um, if you write code that runs asynchronously, it is event-driven so that it keeps relaunching as different things come in. Like a lot of things run by interrupts. A uh, key press happens, you interrupt and handle the key press. Network data comes in, you interrupt and handle it. If you're gonna do that, you have to write your code very carefully because it's likely that it will be halfway through something when another copy of it will launch to handle the next request. Like the Apache web server, if you look at Linux, there's a separate process for every connection. Many people are connecting to your web server and they're all running in different processes the same code. So you have to be aware. Uh, this is how you create race conditions. This is why one thing that is very commonly done and very dangerous is to write into temp files. Like I do this a lot on my server because it's just easy, but it's dangerous and sleazy and I don't care because my server is there to be hacked. But I'll take something, write it to a folder, a file in the temp folder, and then I'll read it later. Well, if it's multi-threaded multi code, for all I know, I wrote it, then some new connection came in, launched a new process, and wrote on top of it, and when I read it, it's not what I put there. It's what somebody else put there. And that's how you create race conditions. And this kind of thing frequently slides past testing because you'll only have a problem if you have a lot of requests. So some kind of test environment where you run it a few times to see if it works, it'll be fine, but when you put it on a real server and run it right up to peak load, then it won't be fine. All right. So I think that's it, and we're down to the cahoots, which I've got here. So. This is happening to me now, the reason my uh, SQL Server project was down today is because I put a scoring engine up to take it to RSA, and I wrote my scoring engine with Python using the request library, and it used up all the RAM on my server so SQL wouldn't start. And I looked, and this is a known problem. The requests library, if you load a page, it puts it in RAM and it never releases that RAM. It just uses up all your RAM. And people are complaining about it and they say, that is by design, you are supposed to write re-entrant Python code to handle it. If you just make simple Python code, you have a memory leak, and that's what I had. All my memory was leaking away. So I'm gonna rewrite it to be much less secure. I'm gonna write a command line to use wget in bash, which does not have this problem. So I'm gonna use Python to make the command line, go to wget, put it in a temporary file, and read the scores out of a temporary file, which will get the job done, but it will create several vulnerabilities, including a race condition, and a possible command ejection vulnerability too, creating a bash line from the data in Python. But I don't care because it's my attack server, but this is why things get so unsafe. Just like everybody else, I found that the fast way to do something is often much easier than the secure way. Anyway, guess we're ready? So, which vulnerability comes from stir copy? That's by default unbounded. Stir copy copies one string into another without checking the length and without limiting the length. So it can put a big thing in a small box and that creates the classic simple buffer overflow we've been using. All right, which one comes from comparing one data type to another? Okay, that's integer conversions is one of the many problems here. 
also integer to string conversions, array to single object. There's a variety of these in a variety of languages where you compare two things that are not of the same type, leading to unexpected conditions. Which is likely when there are multiple pointers to an object. All right, double tree is one of the many things that might logically happen. All right. Which one is likely when you process several bytes at a time? Skipping past the null, of course, we saw that in the Apache module. All right, which one is caused by one part of the program corrupting data put there by another part? That's multi-threading. You're using something, and another thread comes in and uses it too, and now you have a problem. All right. Which one typically exposes data from the stack? All right, that's format string. We've used that. In the simplest case, it gives you uh, information disclosure where you can see what's on the stack. So we got tip tip. I know who that is. And Damien and Bill M. All right. Um, so I think that's it. Any questions about anything? I'm just going to stop share and go upstairs and see if anybody wants help. I'll stay in the building till four, but then I'll shut up these labs. All right. Well, I'll see you folks next week, and I think that's the last meeting. Next week, yep, after that, no more class, just an online final. What did you go to China? Uh, I think the 8th or the 9th. I'll be there for about a week.